Hi, welcome um, everyone um, on this uh, in this webinar on farmers' rights uh, achieving complementary um, complementarity between the informal and the formal uh, seed systems. As any of all of you who have attended our webinars uh, know, this uh, webinar is just like the past webinars, a fruit of the collaboration between uh, GFAR, the Global Forum on Agriculture Research, uh, the organizers of these webinars, um, and several of our partners and affiliated organizations, um, and of course, members of our GFAR community. On a personal note, let me um, just interrupt this program for a moment here to say that uh, we're really uh, positively surprised to see the amount of people who subscribe to this um, to this webinar. Uh, at this moment, we have about 155 to be exact. Uh, many of our GFAR webinars um, have been on communications or on communications related topics. Um, that's where the idea of organizing webinars was originally born from. Uh, but this is our third webinar in, in the past six to seven months, uh, which is based on a pure agriculture or food security topic. Uh, after previous uh, webinars on gender and agriculture data and a webinar on tropical um, agri on the tropical agriculture platform or tap presented by um, uh, FAO. So while um, we're always a bit anxious uh, when announcing a webinar on a real niche topic such as uh, farmers rights and seed systems, our first thoughts were, oh mio dio, uh, will we have a good quorum of people inter interested in this niche uh, topic? But I'm really happy to confirm that uh, each time, and now once again, my fears were unfounded. Point in fact is that 155 of you subscribe to this webinar. Now, during this webinar, the man behind the scene is uh, Charles Plemmer, who will manage the slides and the technical aspect of the webinar. My name is Peter Casier, and I will be monitoring um, and moderating your questions. And I have also the honor of introducing our speakers. Charles and I both work for the GFR Secretariat and manage their social media and online media channels and outreach projects. Now, the brain, the engine, the driving force be uh, behind today's webinar is Juanita Chavez, who is also working for the GFAR Secretariat. She assembled our quorum of champion speakers today. And like a mother hen, she has been herding our speakers to present you with um, a great webinar program today. Um, likewise, the speakers themselves have invested a significant time and effort to prepare for this webinar. So kudos, thanks, merci, gracias, and shukran to all of you. But before we start, a word on the logistics of this webinar for those of you who have not attended a GFAR webinar before. For this webinar, we're all connected through a service called BlueJeans, which allows everyone to see the presentations and those speakers with a webcam. Feedback, tips, and questions should only be done via the chat box. So please uh, mute your video and audio and keep it muted. Otherwise, it will suck up a lot of bandwidth from everyone. Even though we are with a big group, I would still like the session to be as interactive as possible. So I do encourage you to send remarks, suggestions, and questions already during the presentations using the chat box, the icon of which you can find on the top right side of your window. After the presentations, we will have ample time for Q&A. So when you have a question or suggestion that pops up in your mind, just type it right in, and we'll go over them during the Q&A time at the end of the presentations. So after this webinar, we will also send you a link um, with um, the recording of the webinar, the presentations, and some links to websites and resources uh, we might have mentioned during the webinar, and also questions, um, sorry, answers to the questions that we might have not have been able to answer during the webinar itself. Um, I see Charles already put up the slide on the program for today. Um, so we'll start off with uh, Rudach, um, um Chavez, who will um, give um, an introduction, a framing of the webinar. Um, um, she will be followed by Mario, Mario Marino, who works for the Secretariat of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, based in FAO, um, in Rome, Italy. He will talk about the recognition of farmers' rights uh, by the international community. Um, he will be followed by Gloria Otieno, joining us from Uganda, um, uh, Kampala, Uganda. She works for the Biodiversity International Regional Office, and she'll talk about the open source seed systems. Then uh, we still seem to have a problem to connect to Sonja, um, who is joining us from the European Seed Association. Um, we'll see if we can still pull uh, Sonja in while the others are starting off with their presentations. Sonja, 
was scheduled to talk about the complement complementarity uh, from the point of view of the formal seed system. And then to um, round things off, we have Bram de Jonge joining us from the Netherlands. Uh, Bram works for Oxfam Novit um, and will talk about the complementarity from the legal or the policy uh, perspective. Then we'll have a Q&A session based on your uh, input in the chat channel. And then Juanita will wrap up uh, the webinar itself. So Renita, now is your time to unmute uh, video and audio. So you're ready to come in. Um, Juanita will introduce the frame of our webinar. Juanita Javes is a lawyer with more than 10 years uh, of experience on access to genetic resources and benefit sharing. She works for the Secretariat of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture for five years, and currently is a senior advisor for the GFR Secretariat on genetic resources, intellectual property rights, and farmers' rights. She coordinates the joint capacity building program with the treaty and other organizations on the implementation of farmers' rights. Junita, the floor is yours. Please uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Peter, and welcome, everybody. Um, I will, as uh, Peter said, um, talk about the framing and the program of this webinar. Uh, please, next. Next um, slide. So when we talk about agriculture, uh, we should talk about farmers and we should talk about all kinds of farmers from the smallholder or family farmers up to the commercial or bigger enterprises farmers. They all contribute to food security through crop genetic improvement uh, by farmer selection, classical plant breeding or modern biotechnologies. There are two main systems, the informal and formal seed systems. The formal seed systems aim to maintain varietal identity and purity, while the informal seed system is characterized by its diversity and includes most of the ways in which farmers themselves produce, disseminate, and access seeds directly from their own harvesters, through exchange among friends, neighbors, and relatives, and through local grain markets. Next slide, please. Well, the label suggests that, that, that these are two different and very distinct systems. In practice, they share important points of integration. For example, on the demand side, farmers have long grown from the formal and informal systems, accessing seeds from different crop, for different crops through different channels, for example. On the supply side, an increasing number of breeding programs involve farmers in a variety um, selection. In some cases, farmers sit on different release committees and improved varieties are disseminated through local channels. Both systems have considerable strengths, but they need to be uh, to achieve food security, adapt crops to unpredictable uh, environmental changes and respond to human needs. Joint efforts by different stakeholders from the formal and informal seed system and strong partnerships are needed in order to strengthen complementarity between these systems, as no one, neither stakeholders alone or organizations, can do this by its own and collective actions are needed. Next slide, please. So the aims of the webinar are to first reach a common understanding of what farmers' rights are, uh, and uh, the background, to understand the background of their international recognition. Second, to exchange information on a specific examples, enhancing com complementarity between the formal and informal seed systems. To identify partnerships between stakeholders from the informal and formal seed systems to achieve this complementarity, and to identify the challenges that are still there uh, um, making a little bit difficult sometimes this complementarity. But of course, the final and most important one is to motivate you, the participants, to think about your own role in achieving the complementarity of these systems and identify ways of working together, strengthening partnerships and collective actions. Next, please. So under this frame, uh, a presentation will be made first regarding what farmers' rights are as they relate to seeds 
and the recognition of these rights by the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And then we will have three interesting presentations um, illustrating examples on how to achieve complementarity in practice between the systems, uh, including complementarity and integration of conservation on farm and ex situ, innovation systems, and holistic policies and legal measures recognizing and integrating the roles of the various players of both the formal and informal seed systems. Next, please. So what will be the next steps uh, that we would like to achieve? Well, we will um, develop a blog after the webinar linking to presentations, uh, of hopefully including one presentation from a farmer's representative who couldn't um, join us to, today, uh, and a summary of the discussions. And we will have there also a link uh, where participants could also um, identify their roles, uh, share with us what collective actions they uh, would like to develop uh, and undertake, or any other information about collective actions and partnerships that you already um developing uh you know uh trying to get this complementarity in practice between the formal and informal seed system and we will also have a report or a document um about this webinar uh, our our exchange of views and um discussions to report back to the seventh session of the governing body of the international treaty uh which is going to meet this year at the end of the year and other bodies uh, that will be uh, relevant for these discussions. So I hope we have uh, a very good in exchange of ideas. There will be time enough for all of us to, to participate. And uh, I hope this will be a very uh, a real success. Uh, and thank you very much. Excellent, uh, thank you, uh, Juanita. And as you said, um, it's always, um... Um, a challenge to give a webinar, um, but the challenge is not just to give the webinar, but also to see it as an entry point into a further discussion. Uh, so I'm really um, uh, glad to see that many people already online, but we also hope that together with Juanita, you guys will continue with the discussions and the work further on uh, farmers' rights and the, the seed systems uh, together with Juanita. Uh, meanwhile, Mario, if you can please uh, unmute um, Juanita, you can mute. Um, Mario, if you can unmute your audio and your video. Now, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Mario Marino. He's a technical officer at the Secretariat of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. He's based at FAO in uh, Rome. Since May 2008, he has been coordinating the work on sustainable use of PGRFA and farmers' rights in the Treaty Secretariat. He is uh, also a focal point uh, with uh, the International Agriculture Research Centers for training programs on the conservation and sustainable use of PGRFA. Uh, he holds a master's degree in agriculture science and a PhD in agrobiology and agrobiochemistry. Mario, I can see you're online. Please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thanks, Peter, and thanks to everyone for joining us uh, with, uh, with this uh, webinar. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have some problem with my throat, but I will try to do my best uh, to talk. Um, next, please. Next uh, slide. Um, as you know, uh, I would like, uh, first of all, uh, to give you uh, just a few words about the International Treaty on, on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. Uh, in particular, because uh, um, inside the treaty, there is the acknowledgement of the farmers' rights, and this is an international instrument for the management and conservation of crop genetic resources for food and agriculture. It was adopted uh, in 2001 and uh, entered into force in 2004. Uh, many of you already know that the, the main objectives of this treaty are the conservation, sustainable use of PGRFA, and the fair and equitable benefit sharing. But one of the cornerstone of this uh, international uh, legally binding instrument is the uh, farmers' rights. Next, please. Um, I, um, I heard before from Juanita that uh, one of the aim of the webinar is to reach a common understanding of the farmers' rights. 
To be honest, uh, we have been uh, trying to do and uh, to accomplish uh, such uh, an important goal, uh, but it seems that uh, there are still uh, different, uh, you know, um, indications and different meanings about the farmers' rights, despite there is uh, uh, in the treaty a specific uh, um, and clear, I would say, clear definition. Um, the important role uh, of farmers uh, is, uh, was recognized by the contracting parties, in particular because uh, uh, they wanted, uh, through the treaty, to acknowledge the enormous contribution that the local and the indigenous communities and farmers of all regions of the world have made and, are, and uh, they will continue to make for conservation and development of PGRFA. So this, uh, in a nutshell, constituted the basis of a food and agriculture production throughout the world. And uh, the farmers uh, uh, reaffirming this uh, contribution is the basis of the farmers' rights. Next, please. Um, why was uh, so important to acknowledge the farmers' rights? First of all, I will say to reward them for their contribution to the global genetic pool and food security. Um, and, but in particular, to give them and to enable farmers to continue as a stewards of crop diversity. And um, this, uh, we have to be clear about that because uh, the, when uh, the treaty was adopted, Farmers' rights, as other, uh, you know, um, issues like uh, conservation, characterization, evaluation, and sustainable use of plant genetic resources, were inserted in a package of the treaty under the direct control of each contracting parties. So, so um, the responsibility uh, to to recognize uh, the contribution of a local and indigenous community still uh, remaining under the national law and under the national uh, control. Next, please. Um, the idea of farmers' rights uh, came up uh, in the 1980s, and uh, it was, uh, first of all, uh, um, you know, uh, presented as a proposal to balance the increased demand for plant breeders' rights. Um, and in particular, uh, because uh, um, civil societies, farmers' organizations, NGOs, uh, uh, international organizations, and so on, uh, wanted to draw, to draw the attention of uh, the activities that the farmers uh, have been doing during uh, the, the years, and in particular, uh, um, which kind of balance uh, uh, and which kind of acknowledgement uh, uh, would have been uh, more appropriate to acknowledge uh, the, the, the important role of the farmers in the world. Next, please. Um, this is the more or less uh, something that uh, maybe is in mind uh, uh, of some of you, because uh, for the first time in the 1987, uh, there was a consideration, suggestions, and so on in a, uh, in a working group under the FAO on the foundation of all the, that uh, formed the foundation for all further negotiation of farmers' rights, and uh, this working group. Uh, uh, in this working group uh, were established uh, many uh, important things, but in particular the recognition for the first time of the farmer of farmers' contribution to food security. Uh, they need uh, to reward farmers for their contribution. The rights holders were not to be single farmers or communities, but uh, the idea was uh, to, uh, to 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 consider uh, uh, the people. Uh, and farmers and plant breeders' rights uh, uh, were, uh, you know, uh, considered uh, simultaneously, uh, seeking a balance uh, in between. Next, please. Um, I will not 
um, spend a lot of time on that, but just to say that the two resolutions were the milestones for uh, uh, the farmers' rights, uh, that at that time was a not uh, a legally binding concept. But uh, it's quite interesting to know that the farmers' rights uh, at that time, in the phrase was, will be implemented through an international fund, but this fund never materialized. So um, this is more or less linked with uh, uh, the common understanding of farmers' rights that Juanita mentioned before. And uh, we will be quite uh, happy if uh, the uh, contracting parties of the international treaty could acknowledge an international fund for that. But for the time being, uh, the, this fund um, never materialized. Next, please. Um, uh, the reaffirmation of the concept of the farmers' rights uh, through the years was in particular um, well noticed by in the Convention of Biological Diversity when the convention was adopted in 1992. And um, in this case, it was identified the realization of a farmer's right as one of, a, of the outstanding issues for uh, further negotiations. And in particular, it was uh, uh, at that time, FAO was uh, invited uh, to commence a negotiation for a legally binding international regime on the management of plant genetic resources. And, and years later, uh, the FAO uh, adopted uh, the International Treaty. Next, please. Um, in the treaty, the text, uh, I know that for, uh, for some of you is quite uh, familiar to talk about Article 9, Farmers' Rights. I'm not very, uh, you know, inclined to to call uh, this uh, important concept Article 9. And so I will refer about farmers' rights. Um, but the farmers' rights uh, recognize uh, the contribution that the farmers are doing. And um, maybe later on, uh, when there will be a discussion, uh, we can uh, go through the different activities, uh, but in particular, uh, the measures to protect and promote farmers' rights, uh, which one, which of them uh, are considering, uh, are, have been considered uh, inside the international treaty. Next, please. Um, now, a few words about the implementation of farmers' rights, because uh, uh, during uh, these years, um, I'm referring from 2007 until uh, that until now, um, we have uh, um, the, there were uh, different uh, uh, meetings, uh, in particular uh, um, in the context of the international treaty, uh, and uh, as well as uh, uh, six governing bodies uh, in which uh, were discussed uh, the concept of the farmers' right and how to recognize uh, the farmers' rights. Uh, different resolutions and so on, but the work was very, you know, very, very slow in terms of um, um, capacity, in terms of um, resources, in terms of, uh, I'm referring to financial resources and human resources on that. Uh, next, please. Um, recent undertakings uh, were you know, where one of these uh, is, I would say, the most important was the global consultation on farmers' rights uh, that was held uh, last September in Bali, Indonesia, thanks uh, to the contribution, uh, active contribution of Indonesia and Norway, and uh, even with uh, with the financial resources gave us by Italy and by Switzerland. 95 participants from uh, almost 40 countries uh, representing all regions uh, were over there, and in particular farmers' organizations, indigenous and local communities, government representatives, and other uh, relevant stakeholders. So we are finalizing uh, uh, in these days uh, the, the report, 
that will be published, uh, I hope, next month and will be presented uh, to the governing body, to the seventh session at the end of this year. Next, please. Um, the main uh, key recommendations uh, that will be presented to the governing body by the co-chairs of the Bali consultation, um, we, we put uh, in this slide uh, just uh, some of them that we are considering more representative, in particular to establish an ad hoc working group to guide uh, and assist the contracting parties in the implementation of the farmers' rights. That will be the key, in particular for developing countries, but I would say also for developed countries, because uh, it seems strange, but uh, many of the developed countries are still, you know, uh, quite uh, in, um, um, I would say, in, uh, difficult to implement the concept of uh, farmers' rights, uh, taking into account that, that there isn't a rich common understanding on this, uh, uh, on this concept. And the second one uh, was uh, to request uh, to us, to the Secretary of the International Treaty, to provide organizational assistance for the ad hoc working group on farmers' rights. And uh, for sure, uh, this uh, will uh, imply uh, a more, uh, I would say, a more uh, structured and more uh, important organizations inside the Secretariat of the International Treaty. Um, it was also asked uh, to invite contracting parties uh, to contribute uh, to, to the work of this uh, working group on farmers' rights, uh, financially speaking and organizational, uh, through organizational uh, support. And it was also, the contracting parties were, were also invited to provide the Secretariat uh, um, the legislation that they are adopting, uh, other regulations uh, relating to the implementation of farmers' rights, and uh, last but not least, I would say, call on contracting parties to revise the seed laws, intellectual, intellectual property laws, and most probably we will uh, uh, hear uh, uh, more uh, about this uh, issue later on. Next, please. Um, another global consultation was held uh, in, uh, in uh, Africa, in Harare, in Zimbabwe. My colleague Jane de la Cruz uh, was over there. And uh, I have to say that this was uh, one of the very uh, important uh, um, steps in order to prepare the global consultations held in September last year. Uh, and the different organizations, university and uh, CGIR centers were also represented in this uh, consultation in Harare. Next, please. Um, for sure, the International Treaty Secretariat, uh, um, I have to say that uh, we are trying to do our best to support uh, different initiatives and so on. But I have to acknowledge uh, uh, the work that we are doing in the joint program on capacity building on farmers' rights with uh, GIFAR. Uh, and thanks in particular to Juanita, Mark, and the other um, and the other colleagues in the GIFAR that are uh, making uh, a lot of efforts on that. Um, collaboration uh, is, uh, is quite uh, important uh, inside FAO, in particular with the different units and with the other UN agencies, uh, and uh, for sure with Biodiversity International, uh, located here in Rome. Uh, with the civil societies, the IPC secretariat uh, here in FAO, with the QNO in Geneva, and regional and national stakeholders uh, to promote uh, capacity building, awareness raising on farmers' rights. And um, for sure, all these collaboration and partnership uh, are providing us uh, uh, the goods, um, you know, the, I would say that the good energy, in particular, uh, to 
to give uh, a follow up on the Bali Global Consultations outcomes and recommendation, but in particular about the preparation of the next uh, uh, important steps, uh, important step for us about uh, uh, the GP7 that will be held at the end of the year. Uh, next, please. Um, Next, please. It's uh, coming. Um, go ahead, uh, Mario. Yes, uh, the realization of the farmers rights, uh, you know, um, we are uh, um, we are uh, receiving a sub submission from contracting parties and other stakeholders. Some examples of the best practices, lesson learned, uh, you can uh, download it from uh, are available and downloaded from uh, the ITPG RFA website. Just the two examples about the benefit sharing fund uh, that, as you know, uh, is the fund of the international treaty uh, providing uh, uh, financial resources for projects uh, in, the, in the developing countries. And this is the case of, uh, in particular, uh, uh, acknowledge, the, acknowledge the farmers' rights and uh, as a primary form of non monetary benefit sharing. Um, we are now in finalizing the fourth call for proposals of, um, that will be hopefully launched uh, uh, by the end of this year. And um, we included in this uh, slide also the India's protection of plant varieties and farmers' rights. That is more or less uh, the more the most representatives uh, representative um, law in terms of breeders, farmers, and researchers, all these stakeholders are inside the, uh, all together, and uh, it recognizes the farmers as cultivator, conserver, and breeders. Uh, I think that I finished. Uh, next, please, if I remember well. Um, uh, yes, I think that. Uh, no, there is another one about the educational model uh, of farmers' rights that we are uh, finalizing, uh, even uh, in this case, uh, for the next uh, governing body. Um, this is uh, one of the five educational models of the international treaty. One was about the uh, generic introduction of the treaty, another on conservation and sustainable use, another about the funding strategy. One about the multilateral system that we are still uh, we are still working on, and uh, the farmers' rights. So uh, we are ready to publish it. Uh, the module is uh, for a broad range of uh, stakeholders, especially for the learners that are new in the international treaty. The module explains the conceptual foundation of farmers' rights. And in particular, based on submission of the contracting parties. So it seems uh, more or less uh, are written books uh, with the publications and so on that can be easily, I would say, digest uh, even from uh, people that are not so familiar with the concept of, uh, of intellectual property rights and uh, uh, provide also some useful links to the website, the books, and uh, in particular initiatives relevant to the farmers' rights. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, attention, and I have to thank in particular my colleagues uh, Jane uh, de la Cruz and uh, Kien, uh, Tobias Kien. Uh, they gave me also some inputs for the preparation of this uh, uh, presentation. Thanks. Thanks, um, Mario. Um, please, you can go on audio and video mute again. Gloria, uh, if you can go on unmute for audio and video. Um, Mario, thanks for um, putting all of this into a historic and legal perspective on the recognition of both farmers' rights and the international treaty on plant uh, genetic uh, resources, uh, the recognition by the international community. Um, we are now switching from uh, Europe uh, to Kampala in Uganda. Uh, Gloria Otieno is the associate expert on genetic resources and uh, food security policy. Um, Gloria works at the Biodiversity International Regional Office in Uganda. She is a, a genetic resources and food security policy specialist 
at Biodiversity International with specialization on genetic resources policy, access and benefit sharing, farmers' rights, and treaty implementation, climate uh, seed, uh, resilient seed systems, um, adaptation planning, and food security policy development. She also has an extensive uh, experience in East, West, and Southern Africa. Uh, Gloria, if you're online, please uh, go ahead. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter, Juanita, and uh, the organizers of this uh, webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm going to present some experiences from East and Southern Africa with activities that we have been doing with farmers and that are really contributing to the realization of farmers' rights. Next slide, please. I'll start by reiterating the challenges faced by farmers today. The most pressing challenge as per today is climate change. Climate change is leading to loss of biodiversity and therefore farmers are finding it difficult to access seeds that are suitable for climate change. And as a result, there are also pests and diseases that are hindering uh, production of farmers and leading to low productivity. Then another challenge is inaccessibility of suitable seeds. Suitable seeds here means seeds with qualities that farmers require and need, such as early maturity, drought tolerance, cooking characteristics, and taste preferences. And I must reiterate that farmers access most of their seed, especially in Africa. 80% of the seed that farmers use come from the informal sector. And when they are able to access this seed, it is of poor quality. So again, it leads to low productivity. Then when they eventually access modern varieties or improved varieties, they don't have the inputs that they require or they cannot be able to afford or access the inputs required for this seed to, 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 to have uh, optimum production. So again, we have low productivity as a consequence and food and nutrition security. Next slide, please. So bearing in mind these kinds of challenges, what we do is we work with communities in different countries to try and help them find suitable genetic resources through various access and benefit sharing mechanisms and the multilateral system. We realize that suitable genetic resources or adapted genetic resources can be found in international gene bank collections, and these are freely accessible through the multilateral system of access and benefit sharing. This can be given to farmers to try to evaluate and to select and to use within their communities. But these genetic resources can also be used by breeders to develop varieties that are responding to climate change or responding to pests and diseases and other biotic and abiotic stresses. Then there is also national gene bank accessions or collections from national gene banks that can be accessed by farmers or also by breeding programs. Then we have collections within communities and these communities, these collections are managed by the communities, conserved by the communities and they apply their local indigenous knowledge for the continued maintenance and conservation of these uh, genetic resources. And we are happy to say that communities have voluntarily included their material in the international gene bank collections or national gene bank collections where they are accessible to breeders. And we have also had national gene banks repatriate lost varieties to communities to help them access genetic resources and therefore equitably participate in benefit sharing. Next slide, please. So when farmers access these genetic resources, what do we do next? We go through participatory evaluation and selection. And this is mainly to help farmers with the traits which they feel are important for their productivity and for their food security. And you can see from the pictures there, we evaluate these varieties with farmers. And then they select the promising varieties, which can then go to 
the breeding programs together with the breeders for participatory breeding, or they can conserve these materials in their communities through either community seed banks or through on-farm in, in situ management practices and then use them. And these ones, they can also share them and access them freely amongst themselves. Next slide, please. So when they get these materials, the farmers share these seeds through seed fairs. And we've organized seed fairs in various countries, in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Uganda, in Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Rwanda. And you can see from the pictures, farmers are freely sharing seeds, both of local varieties and improved varieties, and even any materials that, that have come in from the national gene banks, or from international collections that they have participatorily selected and evaluated that they find prom promising can then be freely shared through these seed fairs. So these are some of the activities that we do to see that farmers are equitably sharing, uh, participating in benefit sharing, and that they are free to save and uh, exchange seed. Next slide, please. And not forgetting the important partnerships that are required or the collaborative, uh, co the collaborating institutions that make this possible. I'll just give an example of uh, uh, partnerships between uh, research, uh, national agricultural research, Biovasi International, which also uh, is uh, research, the National Gene Bank, and, and this particular community seed bank. The Community Seed Bank was established with the support from Biovasi International and the National Agricultural Research Organization, together with funding from uh, Jeff and uh, other organizations. So it was established to help the farmers combat the effects of pests and diseases on their beans. So the Community Seed Bank holds are about 69 varieties. Some of these varieties have come from the National Gene Bank. They were repatriated because they had been lost uh, within the community. Some of these varieties have also come from uh, international exchanges between countries. For example, 10 varieties from Rwanda. All these are being conserved and used within the national, uh, the, this community seed bank. And they have duplicates that are kept for them at the national gene bank in the, in the event that they lose some of this material, they can always go back to the National Gene Bank to access them and use them within the community. And I must say that this community seed bank now supports over a thousand farmers who access their seed from this seed bank. And uh, they, this com particular community seed bank is also being used as a learning platform for other farming communities that want to establish community seed bank. And they have been trained in uh, quality seed uh, production to produce clean seed, to conserve this seed, and they use traditional knowledge. As you can see, they store their seed in open baskets. So they use indigenous knowledge to come up with ways of keeping this seed viable for a period for the whole planting season, or even for a period of, of a year. Next slide, please. Other partnerships that are important for this endeavor are, for example, looking at the role of in some intermediaries, such as local NGOs. In Zimbabwe, we have an NGO called Community Technology uh, Development Trust, which is in Zimbabwe, and it has been doing activities with communities in terms of accessing CG center materials from ICRISAT. These are materials that have been developed by breeders in ICRISAT, that they, 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 they do participatory variety testing and selection with farmers so that farmers can be able to have promising varieties of millet and of sorghum. And they work in three main communities in, uh, in, uh, in Zimbabwe. And they've also been able to help these communities establish uh, their community seed banks, where they also store their materials, they maintain their materials, they conserve their materials, and they also provide technical support in terms of training the farmers 
on conservation, training the farmers on good agricultural practices, and training the farmers on quality seed production. So you can see that there are many types of partnerships here. We have local NGOs and CG centers such as ICRISAT also playing their roles in terms of uh, 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 contributing to the realization of farmers' rights. Next slide, please. When it comes to protection of traditional knowledge and uh, conservation through community seed banking, we have examples of these two community seed banks from, uh, from Uganda, Kiziba Community Seed Bank and Nakaseke Community Seed Bank. These have also been established with support from Biovasti International, the National Agricultural Research Organization, and uh, with funding from Jeff, UNEP, IFAD, and uh, uh, Swedish, uh, no, Switzerland Development Corporation. So these organizations are well linked with the national gene banks as well as with the breeding programs. They are also linked with the Biovasti International, which provides technical support for conservation, for management of these materials in situ, and basically for research for uh, drought tolerant, early maturing, or, or varieties that are resistant to pests and diseases to help farmers identify these materials with these useful traits that they can then partner with breeding programs, produce materials that are suitable for for, for the farmers. But then I must say that uh, these partnerships have also helped the farmers to restore the lost varieties which had been collected in the localities that were in the national gene banks and vice versa. The community seed banks have also kept their materials in the national uh, uh, collections as duplicates. And uh, what we are now aiming at is to see because the farmers have developed a community biodiversity, biodiversity registers with the varieties that have that are within the community and with the characteristics of these varieties, can we be able to help farmers to register their varieties, for example, in a national cat, uh, catalog? And once these varieties have been registered, can farmers be able to produce seed of these varieties and sell them? So this registration of farmers' varieties is not yet uh, fully catered for under the seed, seed policies and le the legal requirements and the regulations within the country. But we are currently working also to the Ministry of Agriculture, the policy unit of the Ministry of Agriculture, to see how we can influence these policies and how this, this can contribute to the registration of farmer varieties and to make these varieties more accessible because out, also outside the communities. Then these communities seed banks are also being used as learning platforms, as, as I had, had already uh, mentioned, and they have been supported by Biovasti International to establish local seed businesses for production of quality declared seed. And uh, quality declared seed is mainly for varieties that are registered, which means these are only the improved or the modern varieties. So with the registration of farmers' varieties, if the law will permit, we can then include the production of quality declared seed uh, to include also the farmer varieties. So these are some of the activities that are really helping us to increase accessibility of uh, seed within the communities. Next slide, please. I have already mentioned about uh, production of QDS, but I must say QDS, I must stress the point that QDS kind of uh, marries the formal and the informal, because these are uh, modern varieties that are improved, but they are being locally produced within the communities. The Ministry of Agriculture has developed guidelines for their production, and the seed certification unit visits the farmers, in this case, visits the community seed banks to monitor whether the production is as per the guidelines and whether they are meeting the, the, the standards. And after monitoring for a period of time, 
then the seed certification unit gives them the green badge, which means quality declared seed. And this quality de declared seed, they are able to sell it in uh, their locality. And this has been very positive in terms of improving access to quality seed for farmers and also in terms of price and proximity. Because before this, if you wanted improved seed, you had to improve certified seed. You, in some communities, you had to travel to the capital city, maybe 100 kilometers away to buy the seed. But now this seed is available and it is being produced locally. And therefore it, terms, it cuts costs even in terms of uh, price and also increases this, the availability of uh, this seed. Next slide, please. We also do rec recognize custodian farmers who are really championing uh, the maintenance and the conservation of uh, certain varieties. The farmer on the right was honored by the national government and by the president himself for being able to conserve more than 26 varieties of banana in her farm. So she has an in situ banana gene bank. She, this farmer together with her spouse has also, have also established a seed bank within their, their homestead. And many farmers are coming, we are even using in fact her and her farm as a learning platform for other farmers. So we do recognize this, these farmers. And then the other farmer is, is also from South Africa also highly knowledgeable in terms of indigenous uh, knowledge, in terms of varieties. And the other farmer is from Benin, West Africa, the lower left. She is also conserving indigenous vegetable varieties and maintaining them on her farm. And she also has indigenous knowledge on uh, medicinal plants. So we do recognize these farmers by giving them uh, incentives to continue these practices. Next slide, please. We must not forget that uh, household food security lies squarely on women's hands. It is the responsibility of the woman to ensure that her children and her husband are well fed, especially in the African context. So we do support women farmers. And uh, this is an example of uh, women farmers in Gilgil in Kenya, who are being also supported by Seed Savers Network. So you see, we also work with other organizations to, to do this uh, kind of work. And this seed, these farmers have been trained on production of quality seed and proper storage. And they are, the, it's a group of women that have also established their own seed bank one of the women gave up her grain store where the rest of the women in the community <clears throat> store their seed. And they have developed a community biodiversity register and are of course maintaining these uh, local varieties, but they, they also produce you know, uh, local varieties of beans, which they have been identified to have high, for example, high iron content or high nu nutritional content and which they sell as a group to the city or to, you know, other private sector buyers. And uh, this helps them also to, to, to have their incomes and to, to, to maintain their farms. So these are some of the activities that we do. Um, next slide. So I must say that the, there are also challenges that we face, especially with the policy and legal environment in terms of different access and benefit sharing regimes. The materials in the multilateral system have facilitated access, but there are some materials which cannot be accessed by these farmers. For example, from countries that are not, uh, have not signed the treaties or from communities across borders and so on and so forth. So there are some, you know, ABS issues 
that need to be looked at to enable farmers to continue participating equitably in benefit sharing. And then there is also the issue of farmers' rights versus breeders' rights. And I, I will not talk about this so much because my time is also coming to an end and because my colleague will also talk about this. And then stringent seed policies. In some countries, farmers are not even allowed to sell and exchange uh, seed of uh, improved varieties. So you see some of, these are some of the issues that, that come up and that we have to be careful with, that we are not contravening um, uh, national laws and regulations. And then the other issue is in most countries, uh, re the registration of farmers varieties is not yet, you know, implemented. There are no laws or policies or, you know, legal steps that can be used to register farmer varieties and therefore allow farmers to produce seed of their own varieties and even sell them, them locally. There are still requirements from the national seed certification. And these requirements are very stringent for farmers. They cannot be able to meet these requirements and they cannot be like breeders to have 99% uh, DUS, for example. So farmers still need a lot of support to this end. And then of course, this is also exacerbated by low financial capacity to invest in farmers, related, farmers rights related activities because uh, the implementation of farmers' rights is left to the, to the national governments. So we must work together as organizations in research, as national uh, NGOs, as donors, as national governments to ensure that uh, we are implementing farmers' rights and uh, helping farmers to cope with the challenges they face today. Thank you very much. The last slide basically has, next slide please, um, reading materials from Biovasti International website that you can be able to access. So thank you very much for more information. You can always contact us. Thank you, um, Sonja. Thanks for um, um, your uh, presentation in the more open source uh, systems and also covering uh, your underground work uh, from uh, Biodiversity International. Um, we're switching now over back to Brussels to Sonja. Uh, Sonja Sergio um, had a bit of a problem to connect uh, early on. Uh, let's see if she is online. Sonja, if you could uh, please uh, unmute your audio and your video and see if I have you online, uh, Sonja. Yes, I'm here. Excellent. <laughs> that was uh, that was quite exciting. You know, I cannot connect. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'm, I'm glad uh, we have you all sound and safe with us. Now, Sonja is the uh, Director of uh, Intellectual Property and Legal Affairs of the European Seed Association. Sonja is Hungarian and she holds a degree in law from uh, the Budapest University, uh, has a master's in French and European law from the Pantheon Assas University in Paris, and an LM in Intellectual Property and Competition Law from University of Liège in our very own Belgium. She has been uh, working with um, uh, ESA, the uh, European Seed Association, uh, since 2009 as the Intellectual Property and uh, Legal Affairs Director. Uh, before that, she worked at the European Commission. And with ESA, uh, Sonja has primarily been responsible for issues related to the intellectual property protection and plant genetic resources. Beside that, she also handles or seat uh, legislation related to legal uh, questions. And she represents the ESA uh, towards relevant international organizations and European <laughs> institutions. That's quite a mouthful. Sonja, we're all ready for you. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, well, first of all, um, good afternoon to everybody, or maybe good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm very happy to, to be able to contribute to this uh, webinar. Um, and when I was contacted by Juanita, I um yeah I thought that it's it's quite a nice idea to to have such a webinar and I really welcome uh also on behalf of uh, our members uh, the idea to talk about this interesting important and very challenging topic 
with a let's say a more constructive attitude because my feeling is since i'm involved in these discussions for quite a number of years uh is that it's always a very controversial and tense discussion um and the, the title of this webinar is already rather positive because we talk about complementarity which is a positive word uh and also hopefully a constructive one so uh, that um gives us i think a good uh, a better perspective for uh, the future so next slide please so why is complementarity important in this context um can you just push the button peter because i have animation on uh, the slides yeah um you can just push them all through and then it's fine so uh, complementarity is important because uh, actually both sectors and then i refer to the formal and the informal seed sector as we call them often uh, are needed in this discussion so that we can achieve that farmers rights are implemented in the right context and in the right way um, what are the challenges that we need to address at least from my perspective in this whole discussion well, first of all, I think we already heard that from Juanita as well as from Mario, that there are different understandings of the basic concept of farmers' rights. So different understandings from all the different stakeholder groups who are involved in this discussion. And even though I know that the treaty has been trying to address this since a long time, I still believe that it can only be addressed at treaty level and even if we have different uh, understandings as stakeholder groups at some moment in time there needs to be some clarity that is going to be put uh, or shed on this uh, concept so that we can uh, better go on with a common understanding there is a lack of trust when we have this discussion over farmers rights and the implementation of farmers rights and the lack of trust when it comes to collaboration and that lack of trust is basically mutual so it's not one-sided it's not that one sector doesn't trust the other but it's really mutual i think none of the stakeholder groups who are involved are really trusting the other side which is a problem and it needs to be overcome and i think there we have the responsibility as stakeholder groups to work together and try to overcome this lack of trust and then we have a lack of enabling environment as well um, by enabling environment i mean mainly the legal and policy environment which was also referred to by gloria uh, to some extent as well as mario when referring to the need to revise certain areas of laws or policies uh, but i think we also have to bear in mind that it's not one-sided it's also regarding both sides because the legal environment in some cases is also not enabling for the formal seat sector to be able to act in some countries and but that is something that has to be addressed on the national level in the different countries where uh, where these environments legal and policy environments have to be put in place next slide please i would like to focus the rest of my uh, talk to the lack of trust because that is from the challenges that i mentioned that is the one which I think has to be um, addressed at the stakeholder level and since I'm representing one of the stakeholder groups involved in this discussion uh, that's where I think I should focus so how is the general trust situation now um, regarding this topic of farmers rights I would like to tell you about uh, a project so this is a story of a project by a company one of our members uh, and actually the project is focused on the implementation of farmers rights this is a project in collaboration um, of this potato breeding company which is based in the netherlands um, and the um, international potato center in peru as well as some national partners and the idea of the project is to implement a novel model to practically um, improve benefit sharing with custodian farmers so the idea of the project is basically to set up a startup fund uh, which can enable farmers to better organize and better represent themselves on the national level 
and this fund is uh, made available by this company, which is a member of us. Um, and they helped these farmers on the national level to better organize themselves. So now they have started up an association, which is called Aguapan. And it's currently a pilot project running with uh, 43 uh, custodian farmers, potato farmers. And uh, they have already used the first uh, fund, which was uh, made available to them. And they can use it for whatever they want to use it. So some use it for buying agricultural inputs, some use it for education, some use it for healthcare, and maybe some other issues as well. Next slide, please. So um, I presented this project first a year ago at a, at an event related to uh, biodiversity in general, access to genetic resources, but there was also some sessions about farmers' rights. And when I presented it, the first reaction I got from um, representatives of the informal sector, as well as policymakers, was the following. Well, this cannot be really true. Why would a seed company do such a thing? There must be something behind. So uh, next slide, please, to show you why would a seed company do such a thing. You can also push this through. Uh, thank you. So where, first of all, seed companies are truly concerned about the challenges of today and tomorrow related to food security, climate change, uh, other challenges, and they are really eager to find solutions. And those solutions need to be found together. Of course, seed companies are also truly concerned about being able to offer the widest possible choice and the best quality seeds to all the farmers all over around the world. And seed companies would do such projects also because they are concerned about making sure that genetic resources are conserved and are available for further breeding. So actually seed companies are involved in a lot of benefit sharing projects, a lot of in-kind benefit sharing projects, which Many of those focus on uh, conservation together with gene banks, evaluation projects, participant, participatory plant breeding projects, and many of them also address actually one of the issues which Gloria mentioned, that uh, farmers, when they have access to modern varieties, they indeed not necessarily have access to the inputs that they need and also to the knowledge that they need to be able to cultivate those varieties. So many of these projects actually focus on capacity building and education, enabling farmers to be able to cultivate these modern varieties. Next slide, please. So where is the proof that seed companies are involved in a lot of benefit sharing projects? Well, we have put a lot of effort in collecting the projects that our individual members are involved in, are initiating maybe sometimes themselves or are doing in collaboration with some uh, local actors or research centers or gene banks. And we have set up a website, which you will see. Uh, well, you see the, the, the map on the slide, but I will also show you the link later on. It's available from our website. And on that website, we put together uh, all these projects and all the, the little leaves represent actually in some cases more projects since we only put one leaf per country where we have a project. And those projects are always uh, involving some of our members, so seed companies. You can see um, two brochures also on the slide which show a couple of those projects, um, but this is not all of course. So some of them show Partnerships, so those are mainly public-private partnerships, and some of those, uh, the other brochures shows uh, capacity building projects in different parts of the world. Next slide, please. So I was asked to be short, <laughs> so I wanted to keep it short, uh, and I arrive it, and I arrive now to my conclusions. How to improve better complementarity? Well. I think um, one thing that we have to achieve absolutely is 
what was also mentioned by Juanita is to have a common understanding of what is meant by farmers' rights, what is actually that has to be implemented on the national level and how that should be implemented on the national level. It is really important to have this common understanding because until we do not have this, uh, it, it will always remain a challenge because we will continue talking next to each other, but not together. And I don't think it will lead very far, to be honest. And the other area where we need to improve, and by the we, I mean all the stakeholders involved in this discussion, is the trust building. As you can see, trust is already there on individual project levels, because there are a lot of projects in place where companies, local actors, public research institutes do work together in order to improve the livelihood of farmers. But this trust has to achieve a different level. It, if it remains on the individual project level, that's already very good because in the end, those projects matter a lot. They bring a lot of benefits to those who are really in need. But I think we could achieve much, much more if we can lift this mutual trust to another level. So if you are interested in having a closer look into all those projects that I was referring to, you can access those from the website to which you have the link on this slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, um, Sonia. Um, uh, to cover the uh, complementary from the point of view of the, the formal seed system. Um, from Brussels, we're switching back again to um, Holland. Um, Bram de Jonge uh, is a seed policy advisor at uh, Oxfam Novib in the Netherlands. He's involved in sowing uh, diversity, um, harvesting security program. Uh, he is also a researcher at the Law and Governance Group of Wageningen University. And Bram, you can now um, unmute. I can see you coming online. Um, Bram specializes in the field of intellectual property rights, access and benefit sharing and seed laws, and is involved in the Integrated Seed Sector Development Africa, I -I -S -S sorry, ISSD Africa. Uh, Bram, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Peter, and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, well, I'm the last speaker. Uh, I will try to keep it very short because uh, I think we really would like to have some time and input from the participants and questions and discussion. Uh, I think it is, um, you can already move to the next slide. Uh, uh, so I'm involved in the Sowing Diversity Harvesting, harvesting Security Program. Some of our partners are shown uh, below on this slide. Uh, some are, uh, not all of them. Uh, we have uh, more partners involved. You can find them on our website. Um, I think it's very useful that we have this uh, webinar and uh, we so far have seen a speaker from an international uh, intergovernmental organization from the public sector, uh, the private sector, and uh, now uh, it's me, the civil society organizations. Um, uh, unfortunately, our farmer organization speaker a representative is not available today, but I think uh, it's clear that if we target uh, the topic of farmer rights, and the complementarity of informal and formal sectors, then the farmers uh, have a key, key central role to play. And uh, I want to stress that perspective uh, a bit more in this talk, uh, next to, of course, zooming into the legal and policy perspective, which was uh, which I'm asked to do so. Turning back to our program, um, we have a mission and an objective that aims to uphold, strengthen and mainstream the rights and technical capacities of indigenous peoples and smaller farmers and to influence local to global policies and institutions on access to and sustainable use of plant genetic resources, for food and nutrition security in the conditions of climate change. The reason why I stress this is that our policy advocacy, our work and perspective on, 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 on policies and the debates and the discussions and the things we would like to change, they are really rooted and come from the local level. And it's true uh, building the rights and technical capacities of farmers that their force can be raised and that their experiences, the, the, the bottlenecks they experience in their daily lives, dealings with seeds, uh, can be brought to the fore on, on local, national and global levels. Next slide, please. 
So we really focus on diversity. This slide is just for your information that we that the program relates to different uh, countries, different agro ecosystems, different crops, many different partners, and several donors. Uh, you can continue to the next slide, please. Um, and we have been working on on different aspects, uh, with the core of the program being rooted on farmer field schools, uh, through which we really would like to strain, aim to build the capacity of farmers. Uh, and some major achievements, I would say, is is that through this approach, there are more than hundreds uh, of uh, farmer field schools established uh, during the program period so far. Uh, Hunger periods have been reduced and sometimes eliminated in certain areas. Um, we invest a lot in developing the curricula and the field guides on, for example, participatory plant breeding, different crops, so that this approach can be scaled up. Um, participatory plant breeding being a tool next to variety selection and enhancement uh, that can be applied in all kinds of areas for all kinds of crops. It's not only low potential, it's often being linked to, but also in commercial areas. And an example is uh, what we, uh, what the program has contributed to together with the national implementation partners like CRISE and others in the Mekong Delta, where in 2014 uh, for the commercial market, I mean, this is a high potential uh, market catering for commercial uh, markets. Um, nationally and internationally, uh, the majority of the seats uh, was provided by the seat clubs. On the basis of these experiences and lessons learned, um, I also captured in some of our research that looks in, okay, how then is the policy frameworks that are currently existing impacting the doings uh, and the practices of, of the farmers, farmers in, uh, in these farmer seed systems? And I would like to, um, focus more on that in the remainder of this uh, presentation. Please um, go to the next slide. Okay, one more example, I would say that's from 2015. What you see in this uh, coming slide is on uh, having communities depositing uh, potato seed. These are from Andes, from the potato park into the global seed vault in Norway. Um, and uh, I think that is that really shows that the complementary that we need uh, in, in the current uh, circumstances that we are facing. Uh, so both ways, uh, farmers catering and helping uh, maintaining the resources, both in situ and ex situ, uh, and the other way around, um, farmers getting access to the materials from, uh, from national and international gene banks. Please, next slide. So the next slide shows a very simplistic um, um, graph of, of the, both the formal and informal seed sector, with the formal in green going from uh, gene banks towards breeding, release of varieties, multiplication and marketing. And the formal, the farmer seed systems, or sometimes called informal seed systems, is, is farmers doing their own seed selection from their own production and the diffusion uh, uh, amongst them uh, through exchange and, and local trade. And I think, whereas this is a simplistic uh, figure, because for each and every crop and area, uh, farmers can operate in different uh, seed systems and uh, different actors will be involved, it still much reflects the problem that we have, I think, because especially from the legal framework, the policy framework, the policy framework that exists mainly as often exclusively focus on this formal uh, chain. Do not look at impacts uh, on the farmer seed systems and do not create a supporting environment, an enabling environment for these farmer, feed, uh, farmer seed systems. Next slide, please. So, in the core of our business is focusing on farmer field schools, creating the capacity, building the capacity at the farmer level. You can continue to the second slide from now, focusing on, on the need to link the farmer seed systems to the international and national gene banks. I think this has already been uh, uh, discussed a lot by Gloria. I will not uh, repeat that, but I think to stress is, is apart from the fact that Oxfam, uh, CTDT, uh, biodiversity have been involved in, in practice of setting up and supporting community seed banks, 
there's still so much to do on this level. I mean, gene banks, national gene banks uh, have many funding problems uh, in many countries. International gene banks uh, and national gene banks uh, do not have really strong track records to be open and accessible for farmers. Uh, farmers have a right, of course, to access these materials, but it will be very difficult for indi individual communities to start doing so. And if they would do so, then would an, a, a gene bank be able to cater for the needs? So community seed banks can really uh, play an, an enormous important role as a, as a, as a step in between uh, the community level and national international levels. Also in terms of seed multiplication and, and we really have to discuss and see how we can make these systems and investments more sustainable. For example, in uh, CTDT already mentioned by Gloria in Zimbabwe, setting up community seed banks where also farmers um, um, pay uh, like one US dollar per year to help sustain uh, the gene bank and the seed bank and uh, help uh, support the multiplication of seed that can really be, make a difference, especially when uh, a, a disaster strikes, in, uh, which has happened over the, the last couple of years in Zimbabwe a lot. Then moving to the next slide into the breeding, of course here participatory plant breeding is key. Uh, also, other speakers have been mentioning this, and and this is not so. Again, this is this should not be a, a one project uh, example. This, if we want to entrench this uh, and really uh, build on the complementarity of both the seed systems, then we need to look into the curricula at universities uh, so that uh, students are uh, familiar with working uh, with participatory uh, methods. Uh, so that there's a continuous stream of, 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 of human resources that can help and set up and build on these uh, uh, projects, uh, both at the farmer side and at, uh, at the institutional side of uh, public and private research organizations. The next slide, if we look into release, right to release, of course, here we have the questions of, okay, to what extent can farmers be included? Uh, can they um, take part in... Um, in the variety release commissions that almost each and every country does have. Uh, often they, they include the farmer representatives, but often this is then a commercial uh, formal sector kind of um, farmer system. Uh, it would be very valuable to take the needs of farmer seed systems into account at this stage, especially what's, uh, what has been mentioned also before is with respect to the release uh, of farmer varieties. I mean, farmer varieties do not fit normally the strict uh, distinctiveness, uniformity, stability requirements, especially not uh, probably stability. Uh, many heterogeneous varieties are of extreme value in local and um, in, in marginalized areas. And But if they cannot be uh, released, then to what extent can they be supported for multiplication and, and further release? Uh, because that is an issue for the for the next slide, um, which now I focus on early generation seed production, which is indeed a strong problem uh, when it comes to uh, the multiplication of uh, improved varieties. But from the policy perspective and the complementarity between formal and informal seed systems, what is most important, I would say, is the whole seed certification process. Uh, because in many countries, like the research we did in Africa, uh, looking at trying to look at all the seed laws, the current seed laws and seed policies in Africa, uh, there was um, there were very few countries, only one actually catering, trying to have a set up a, a catalog for the release of farmer varieties, and then several countries that would only allow the multiplication and 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 uh, the marketing of seed from certified that is cert certified, uh, which is really problematic um, because often it requires multi-location testing throughout the country. Uh, you need to register uh, yourself, uh, your plot. Uh, of course, the seed needs to be uh, quality checked. Um, these are so many steps, which often are not feasible for many farmer communities and also not necessary. I mean, they cater for their community, their, their local uh, area. Uh, and, uh, multi location testing throughout the country is, is not of in their in the interest. Uh, it delays uh, the release and, uh, and makes it um, inaccessible to many farmers uh, to go through this process, making the farm seed system uh, illegal. And there's no, uh, how can you build support on such a legal basis? Um, 
apart from getting the seed certification and freight release mechanisms uh, to cater and support and recognize farmer the needs of farmer seed systems um, there's also of course the the, the 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 later value chain uh, through multiplication and marketing of of seed materials um we establish uh, together with others focus on on farmer seed enterprises i think again in 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 uh, in two in in two months from now there will be a formal release the launch of uh, of a farmer seed a cooperative in zimbabwe champion seeds uh, where actually the the, the 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 smaller farmers are the seed producers for the company and they uh, also are the, the shareholders of the company and uh, the company will focus on on, on maize o opv and hybrids on sorghum on um, on per millet um, and we we decided to include uh, hybrid maize because uh, that will cater and involve there's a demand for that definitely to look at uh, a drought resistant traits and it will uh, bring in um, cash flows that can support the production of quality seed on, on other crops that have, uh, um, yeah, have less commercial potential. This is run by smaller farmers for smaller farmers. Um, so on the last uh, slide uh, will be uh, so two slides ahead uh, from what is now on the screen. Uh, looking at the marketing side, um, this, for example, here, plant variety protection, uh, intellectual property rights come in. Uh, and we have been looking at uh, when considering that many uh, countries are um, becoming or considering to become a UPOF member, how can we support um, smaller farmers uh, to still be able to use uh, and save and exchange and locally trade seed of protected varieties if they wish to do so because at the moment in the DUPA framework that is uh, that's not uh, allowed uh, yet also for improved and protected varieties the informal sector caters and and makes the seed available and it's uh, definitely i guess definitely not in the interest of, of seed companies to go uh, after uh, uh, smaller farmers uh, that uh, try to make a living so uh, these are some of the issues that uh, we have to deal with uh, indeed mutual trust is a very important what other speakers have been saying transparency of what we do uh, and uh, a lot of investments and collaboration that will be needed um, i will try uh, to i will stop here and please open the floor for discussions thank you very much thanks um bram to uh, highlight the complementarity uh, from the legal and policy perspective with some uh, actual uh, examples um we had a lot of questions coming in via the chat channel and you can continue to feed your uh, remarks your discussion points your questions to the um to the speakers if we would not have time to cover all of them during this webinar and for sure we will not have time uh, we will um continue with the follow-up uh, on email and um i'm sure that juanita will continue the discussion um, um uh, offline from the webinar itself however um let's uh, switch over to some of the questions let me go to my um summary here um for the presenters i will pitch the uh, questions to uh, one of you however if any of you would like to pitch in please unmute and then chime in uh sonja if you could already unmute i have a question for you from tizoni um the question is um for Sonja, uh, do you think the companies are implementing many projects directly with the farmers, but not thought of the BSF of the international treaty? Uh, can you say a few words why they prefer this approach? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Yes, I think that companies are actually implementing quite some projects directly with farmers or farmers' organizations or growers um, at local level, in particular in developing countries. Why, um, if I understand the question, why are they not involved in projects which are funded from the benefit sharing fund? If that is the question, um, I think it's simply because um, from the benefit sharing fund, it goes, so you have to apply with your project and then uh, the project can be granted funding from the beneficiary fund and to my knowledge to uh, up until now 
there hasn't been any project proposal uh, going through that channel in which um, our members would have been asked to be partners. Of course, you can also ask why do they not uh, come up with projects themselves and apply for uh, funding from the benefit sharing fund? Um, well, I think the, the reason is that um, they don't necessarily need that funding from the benefit sharing fund uh, for their own projects, but uh, they, they implement their own projects with their own uh, funds because that's also uh, part of the benefit sharing activity that they are involved in. That's part of their, uh, I would call it their goodwill activities. Their goodwill activities. Now I have an echo of myself. Uh, go ahead, uh, I'll, uh, I'll mute, I'll check uh, who is feeding okay. back. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that answers the, the question, but that's how I understood the, the question. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Sonja, if um, any of the other uh, presenters would like to, uh, to chip in, um, more than welcome, just to unmute. Uh, Charles, if you can continue monitoring uh, who is uh, muted and unmuted, um, so we have um, um, an undisturbed uh, dis discussion. Uh, Sonja, thanks. I have um, Gloria. If you can unmute, please. I have a question for you from Tizome. Um The question is, um, is the exchange and sharing of seeds, especially the plant variety protection varieties, uh, legal in all of the, the countries that you have mentioned. And also Sean uh, adds to that, um, he said the Commission for the, Gener uh, for the Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture has asked that seed laws be reviewed to clarify where laws might restrict certain types of exchanges or initiatives working with farmers. Um, also Sean says, well, to date there is a lot of debates uh, here, uh, but of course more of an overview would help. So Claudia, to you. In your experience, in the in the countries that you have mentioned, is the exchange and sharing of seeds uh, legal in all of the countries? Go ahead, Gloria. Well, um, this highly depends on the seed laws that are in that countries that are in each country, and of course the plant breeders' rights laws. The countries that are very UPOV oriented, for example, Kenya, it is actually criminalized to sell seed of uh, protected varieties. But in other countries, you find that farmers are allowed to save and exchange, but not to sell. So it really depends on the prevailing uh, national seed laws, as well as uh, uh, intellectual property laws. Uh, within the country. So countries differ in terms of their national re re uh, legal and regulatory practices that determine what the farmers can and uh, cannot do. And uh, the, other, the, the same thing applies with production of quality declared seed. Really, this is uh, now restricted in some countries to only modern and registered varieties, which mean breeders varieties but in some countries it will it is not allowed for example in kenya it is not allowed you cannot have qds because kenya is a member of of upov and they have very strict regulation to that effect that's something we, yeah go ahead bram um yes we did uh, quite a lot of research on on the effects of plant variety protection in Kenya as being uh, one of the few uh, uh, UPOF members on the African continent, which already for uh, for several years now has an operating uh, PVP system. Um, the actual impact so far on, on farmer seed systems is, is minimal. That's mainly because most of the varieties protected are from the, for the ornamental industry. Uh, if food crops are protected, then mainly it's on hybrid varieties. So the actual impact so far is very, uh, very little. Yet the potential impact, I uh, would say, is, uh, is quite substantial because we also learned uh, also through other research, uh, for example, from uh, Sean McQuay and uh, Louise Perling, is that if you look at where smaller farmers get their seeds from, uh, the majority nowadays get it through uh, local markets, local trade. Uh, this is obviously not allowed at the moment under the UPA framework. 
um, which could really pose uh, problems in future if, if uh, more uh, companies, but also especially public research institutions, start protecting their improved uh, varieties uh, through uh, plant, for plant breeder rights, um, making uh, yeah, access uh, through exchange and local trade by small the farmers illegal. Okay, thank you. Okay, can I also add? Can I yes, also add something? Um, sure. I just wanted to add uh, maybe two small clarifications because it was mentioned uh, with the example of Kenya that the exchange of farm safe seed of protected varieties is criminalized. To be honest, what? I don't know. I, I don't know. It might be true, but what I want to clarify is that the fact that it might be criminalized has nothing to do with UPOV because UPOV does not require any country to criminalize uh, exchange or sales of farm safe seed of protected varieties. That's a matter of criminal law and I think it's quite important to know that. Uh, another issue which I also wanted to clarify is that the question whether farmers varieties can be coming on the market, whether they can be marketed or not, that's also has nothing to do with UPOV because UPOV says nothing about marketing or commercialization. It is only about variety protection. It's an IP right and marketing is regulated by seed laws. Thanks. Very good. Um, you want, Gloria, you want to add something in uh, into the discussion again? Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, as well as, as Sonia has made that clarification, Again, it really depends on the national regulation. And uh, this regulation is both the seed laws, which, is, uh, which says that it is an offense to sell, to sell seed of protected varieties. It is an offense to sell seed of protected, protected variety. But, this, but again, this depends from country to country. In some countries, it is allowed. In some countries, it is not. Yeah, and I think we um, we just dropped your connection uh, there for a moment. Um, let me see, Charles. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, it's Sonia here, that I, uh, I fully agree with what Gloria says. It's absolutely a matter of national implementation. But I think this also shows that uh, there is no one single interpretation, not even of the UPOF Convention, because some countries uh, take it like that and some take it like in another way. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, I have a question. Uh, thanks, Sonja. I, um, Juanita, if you could unmute, I have a question pitched for you coming from Isabel. Um, Isabel says it's important to insist on the importance for all both formal and informal uh, seed systems to have continuous access to and uh, make sustainable use of the international treaty in order to answer to the challenges such as climate change, food security, nutrition. Um, it might not be necessarily very efficient to oppose uh, both one vis-a-vis -vis, uh, development challenges. And also Rudiger adds um, uh, many uh, civil society organizations uh, from around the globe know thousands of different examples and farmers practice them as long as they are not hindered or even criminalized by modern legislation. Uh, you want to comment on that, uh, Juanita? If you can please unmute. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I think I think we have been hearing from the presenters um, different uh, examples in the practice, uh, exactly reflecting that need of in integration between the formal and informal seed system, and of course focused on on how to ensure access uh, to plant genetic resources, which is needed as raw material to. Uh, further improvements and developments to cope to climate change uh, and different human needs. Uh, now that we are also facing this uh, incremental in human population that we will need to feed uh, in in the future. So, uh, as as Bram also very nicely uh, mentioned in his presentation, it's a double via uh, where the, the informal seed system or farmers uh, are able also to access to quality seed or, or seeds that are, you know, conserved and protect uh, in, uh, in different uh, gene banks, national and international. 
uh, to cope with their own food security, but also how they, these communities um, are also contributing to global food security when um, providing their seeds uh, to global uh, gene banks. Uh, so again, the, the need to complement and integrate those systems is, is really key. Uh, and then the, the understanding of, of the relevance of these both systems uh, in the whole issue of food security, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging. Thanks, um, uh, Juanita. Uh, Mario, if you could please unmute. I have uh, the next question for you uh, coming in from uh, Atenchong. Um, and as many of the discussions that we have, uh, these are quite um, sensitive um, uh, issues and very often uh, bringing up quite a bit of uh, uh, strong reactions. So, Mario, um, as Atenchong says, it comes up again and again. The syntax of these legal instruments tacitly relegate the farmers, the small uh, scale farmers, back to the background. So, according to you, what is formal is really informal. You can't really invade pre existing sea systems and automatically claim these systems are informal. Um, now, in terms of power dynamics perspective, um, you already assume that the existing system in an um, anachronistic uh, or secondary way. Uh, does the law explicitly refer to the systems as informal? I can't find this really in Article 9. What informs or guides this interpretation? Go ahead, Mario. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, to be honest, it's uh, quite a tricky question because, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, not just a question. Is uh, more than uh, one. Um, three things. First of all, if we are continuing to, you know, uh, talking about informal versus formal seed system, uh, we cannot, uh, I would say, accomplish uh, a common sense of uh, farmers and farmers' rights. Um, it's also true, uh, and I have to be uh, very frank with, uh, with the participants that are, uh, are joining with us, <clears throat> that uh, the treaty uh, is not the perfect solution in order to acknowledge the farmers' rights, but was the best that at that time, in 2001, and uh, if you consider seven years uh, negotiations, so starting uh, uh, the, the process uh, started in the 1993. So in, at that time was the best solution and the best mediation, I would say, uh, to, to reach uh, the consensus. Um, okay, this is about the informal seed system, about the formal seed system, about the acknowledgement of farmers' rights. It's also true that uh, now the scenario is a little bit changed. In terms of the ABS regime, uh, we have also Nagoya, uh, the Nagoya Protocol. In terms of, uh, you know, food security, we have now the Sustainable Development Goals until 2013. So uh, I, don't, I don't think that we are thinking about anachronistic uh, concept, but we have to consider the historical uh, uh, decisions made uh, some years ago, and how these historical decisions uh, uh, that are in the context of the international treaty can be easily uh, transferred and adopted and if they are still uh, workable for uh, the next uh, future steps. Um, in a nutshell, I would say that the tentative of the co-chairs of the Bali consultation to present some recommendations to the next governing body, and I hope that the governing body will adopt uh, uh, some of these recommendations in a resolution, um, uh, are aiming, I would say, uh, to uh, to define uh, next steps in implementing the farmers' rights. 
So it's also true that at the national level, there are different uh, point of views, different uh, laws, different uh, uh, considerations about the importance of the farmers, about the participatory breeding programs and so on. But my uh, understanding is that uh, we are still on time to work uh, in a concept that can be considered uh, uh, valid all the time. Thank you. Uh, very good. Thanks, um, uh, Mario. If Again, if any of the other presenters wants to pitch in and to uh, any of the questions, please unmute and uh, come right in. Yes, um, Juanita. Go ahead, go ahead uh, Juanita. Just uh, something to uh, to add to, to Mario's uh, response is that, uh, yes, the, the uh, question is correct in the terms that uh, the treaty names farmers, and when talking about farmers' rights uh, and the um, uh, recognition of the contributions, it says all farmers of all regions of the world, but in particular, uh, those in the census of origin and genetic diversity. And uh, I think uh, since the, the, diff, well, the, the adoption of the, of the treaty and even the, um, the negotiations of, the, of this international treaty, uh, it was recognized that we were talking about in terms of farmers' rights of those uh, farmers that are more related to, to the conservation and sustainable use of these resources. Uh, so it means uh, those local communities, indigenous or local communities of farmers uh, that uh, have for centuries um, improved and conserved this these material that are or, or is the basis uh, for future uh, plant breeding. So even if the treaty is not clear, uh, or explicit in, in defining what, what kind of farmers we're talking about, I think that uh, the international community, it is, uh, is clear uh, in understanding that we are talking about these uh, smallholder farmers or farmers from, um, or communities from, uh, especially the centers of origin and diversity of plant genetic resources. Thank you. Very good, thanks uh, Juanita. Uh, Bram, the next one is coming uh, to you, if you could please unmute. Um, you mentioned um, um, educational systems and un university um, uh, educational programs. Do you have practical examples where uh, universities or educational programs for youth are effectively sensitizing students from the ground up on the important uh, on the importance of the informal seed systems and the complementarity between informal and formal seed systems, as well as the legal framework they can work in. Go ahead, Bram. Um, well, I think that uh, some universities and some um, uh, studies, you know, the, the study directions um, do definitely involve uh, the issue of uh, and methods uh, and practices of participatory uh, plant breeding of variety selection and, and etc. Um, when it comes to the more general uh, legal policy framework, I think there's very little attention for that. I mean, also even in terms of literature. I mean, if the if if the legal frameworks are being addressed, and often it's about intellectual property rights. Uh, much less attention goes to uh, impacts of seed laws that regulate uh, for right to release and quality control, etc. Uh, which I think often in many countries um, have a stronger uh, substantial impact, uh, uh, potentially, uh, certainly, but also in practice uh, on farmer seed systems. And I agree with Mario. Uh, that you know we cannot continue talking in terms of formal informal and we definitely prefer the the term farmer led seed systems or farmer seed systems but i think it's about the perspective that you take also when you are involved in participatory plant breeding uh, but especially when you look at the legal legal framework and the complementarity that we would like to establish and promote uh, among these seed systems is how you view farmers you know, are they being considered the mere consumers of seed at the end of a, of a formal process? Because that is what most of these legal frameworks now uh, seem to uh, presuppose. Uh, and I think that the, the challenges, and uh, that's also why, um, at least me personally, I have a much broader interpretation of farmer rights than Article 9 itself. Um, what we need is, uh, is to take into account the 
active role of farmers as custodians maintaining, continuously developing and producing new diversity uh, in connection to all the other stakeholders uh, from the formal sector. Um, and this needs to be recognized and supported in our legal frameworks, uh, because only then we can build and, and improve it. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, don't go yet, Bram, because I'm going to pitch one question, which I think uh, came up several times to each of the presenters one by one. Um, uh, Bram, from uh, Rudiger, uh, he says, well, it, this is a basic and fundamental challenge of farmers' rights, and it links to what you just um, uh, mentioned. Um, is how do we protect farmers' uh, seeds and farmers' breed systems against uh, expropriation and biopiracy by formal uh, intellectual property rights instruments like patents and um, uh, plant breeders' rights? And um, how do we protect the seeds from uh, international um, uh, instruments um, that would hijack the efforts of local farmers? Go ahead, uh, Bram. Well, that's uh, that's a tough question that is, of course, uh, often being discussed. And there are several uh, ways of going about this. Uh, I think one of the key uh, measures, because I guess we do not want to go, um, you know, uh, let me keep it, try to keep it simple. I think if anything is uh, being submitted for a grant of an intellectual property right, either a patent or a, a plant breeder right, then um, we want to know where it comes from, isn't it? We want to know, um, and some countries really go uh, far in that, uh, demanding the full uh, passport data of the parental lines and, and the sources. Um, and we want to have uh, the people uh, working in these intellectual property offices to be able to see uh, what is already there in the fields. You know, we need registries of what is common knowledge, what is uh, what what variety is already out there, and, and in that way, uh, it should uh, be possible to uh, to not have the situation that um, that that patents or plant variety protection can really impact on the accessibility of what is already there. I mean, that's all the, also the, the fundamental idea of intellectual property rights. You know, it has to be innovative, it has to be uh, distinctive, it has to be something new that is, added, uh, that is being added on what is already there. And I think here the problem is, especially with patents, because uh, at the moment, still in some countries, just by patenting a, a single trait, you could have an impact on the use of existing materials that already ex <laughs> contain that same trait. Uh, so these are things that are now being discussed and where we have to find uh, proper solutions for. Very good. I'll pitch the same question. Uh, Sonja, you're next. Um, uh, your comment on the same question. How can we protect the farmer seeds and uh, the farmer seeds breeding system against um, expropriation and biopiracy? by the formal intellectual property rights instruments like patents and the plant breeders rights. Go ahead, Sonia. If you can unmute. Yes, I, I forgot to unmute. Um, well, I can only agree with Bram that this is a, a very challenging question, but I also have to say that um, these are the types of questions which I think we have to overcome in order to have the mutual trust. If we start like this, it's going to be difficult to establish uh, trust. But to answer the question, well, first of all, I don't really believe that biopiracy um, is the biggest issue that we have to address here. There might be some cases that you might call biopiracy where uh, material is or was uh, granted intellectual property rights, mainly patents on, which shouldn't have been the case. And um, I think the criteria in intellectual property laws, and there we talk about patents and plant breeders' rights, are there in order to avoid these situations. Because if you want to ask for patent protection, your invention has to be new. Um, so it is not supposed to be something which already exists. If we talk about plant breeders' rights, your variety has to be distinct from all the other varieties of common knowledge, so everything which already exists. So uh, the legal requirements are already there. 
of course it's important that the uh, that the offices which are granting these rights also are enabled to be able to really um, examine and identify what is already in there so we all have a role in educating those offices um, in order to help them to be able to uh, properly fulfill their uh, examinations and we do that actually a lot at least on the European level with the European Patent Office we do uh, have sessions with them to educate them about uh, prior art in plant breeding and what is already there so that we avoid uh, these kind of issues coming up. Um, maybe another comment on uh, how to protect uh, these resources. I think that was one of the ideas behind ABS laws that uh, have been put in place in order to make sure that they are accessed uh, by fulfilling a certain number of defined criteria. But I think it's also interesting to think about at least what ABS laws do in the end in practice because they are there in order to enable access but in our experience they and that's not really referring to the treaty but that will also depend on the future uh, setup of the the multilateral system but when it comes to the CBD and the Nagoya protocol it doesn't really enable access it rather blocks access at this moment in time and I think that was not the idea behind so we should also think a little bit what is really the aim of these laws and how can we really make sure that they can fulfill the objectives that they are supposed to meaning conservation and sustainable use yeah and and um, I would like to pick up on this um, from um, uh, yes, Mario, just a second. Um, uh, I'm coming to you, Mario, in just a second. Uh, Gloria, you first. Uh, linked to what um, Sonia and Bram have been saying, um, would you also think that there is really a difference between the theory, the treaty, the national law, and the practical uh, implementation as what you have seen in the, your work in the field? Uh, Gloria, if you could please unmute. Yes, there is a difference between how the treaty works with how the, the national law works and how and the different ABS regimes. And I think this should be implemented in a mutually supportive manner. Why? First of all, materials in farmers' hands are not in the multilateral system. For example, a farmer, a custodian farmer maintaining some material, that material is not automatically in the multilateral system. So you have to access it through different uh, through a different uh, mechanism which is through the nagoya protocol or cbd you know uh, by having prior informed consent and uh, under mutually agreed terms and then you can access the materials and the farmers or the communities that are maintaining these materials can directly benefit from either payment or other non-monetary benefit sharing mechanisms but bring going back to the question which was asked by the by uh, by the participant how can we then protect these materials from biopiracy and you know other patenting and all these things and there have been cases here in africa where materials uh, have been you know taken and patented and uh, pe people are complaining and this is real and it is happening and uh, what we what we can talk about now is how can we characterize farmer varieties and then register them in a certain you know either a national register or community register whatever means that we can at least document that this variety existed from this community so that whoever is accessing it and not paying for it or trying to pirate and do all sorts of things can be put to task. But then again, these kinds of exercises require a lot of financial strength and financial capacity, which the farming communities don't have. So again, this goes back to how can we work with the national governments? And this is why I was talking about registering farmers varieties. It is not only for purposes of having these varieties produced and sold by farmers. It is also for, for, for purposes of protecting them. 
that should I go to any community and take their bean variety and add, you know, something small, and then I go and, you know, get uh, protect it and earn from it, the community can have, you know, somewhere to start from and say, look, this variety was from our community. We characterized it. We registered it. And this, for this process to take place, it needs also a lot of help from the research organizations, from the universities. You know, a lot of technology is also required for characterization to go just beyond phenotypic to maybe some molecular characterization. Yeah, and I would like to pick up on this and hand it over to Mario as um, uh, the last one on this particular topic. Uh, Mario, uh, you can answer on, on the issues that uh, your fellow speakers had uh, brought up on, on, let's say, more the protection issue. Uh, but also, I would like to add one uh, additional question where uh, people can actually exchange, because Sonia has been talking about, let's say, the circle of trust in, in which we have to approach each other. But is there a formal forum in which uh, people and the different stakeholders can work together? Mario, uh, it's all yours. Yes, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, just to say that I'm quite, it's quite strange, uh, you know, to receive uh, sometimes questions about how to protect, uh, you know, the farmers' uh, varieties uh, and so on. Um, why is uh, is strange? Because uh, we are not talking about protection. Uh, most probably they are one of the things that I I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't. I was um, unprepared. I would say was about the protection. We are talking here about benefit sharing. We are talking here about the farmers' rights. We are talking here about the access, facilitated access to the material. So why the even uh, we, we, we say it before that we are not in favor to formal and informal you know, uh, sector. Why the informal sector should protect something? Um, saying that, I have some experiences because the intellectual property rights is not the only protection that they can uh, you know, use. Um, for example, for the first time in Italy, uh, there will be the possibility for farmers' organizations of an open pollinated varieties uh, about wheat, uh, open pollinated population, sorry, about wheat, they will present to the certification uh, office and, and this population will be certified as a population as a mix of different uh, uh, you know uh, varieties so in this case there are alternative solutions uh, I would say not to protect but at least to acknowledge the efforts made by the farmers um, um, Peter, I forgot the the, 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 the other question, sorry. Uh, you said about... Uh, is, there, um, is, there, is, there a, is there a forum where the different stakeholders can actually um, uh, work ah, yes. together in, in, in the spirit of collaboration that Sonja yeah. has, um, and, and, the, and the spirit of trust that Sonja has uh, been talking about? Yeah, so uh, there are different possibilities, you know, to exchange uh, um, formally and informally, but in particular to, to trust uh, one each other, uh, each other in, in terms of uh, cooperation and activities that we can do. FAO, the International Treaty, the Commission on Genetic Resources, and why not also the CBD, uh, can offer this possibility to talk uh, uh, and to find solution from different stakeholders. But the point is that uh, we have not to privilege the bottom up, uh, sorry, the, the top down approach, but the bottom up approach is uh, what uh, uh, Gloria was saying uh, uh, many times uh, that if we are not trying to cooperate uh, with the national legislation 
uh, trying to define with them, with the different countries, the same approach, we cannot face uh, the problem, and in particular, we cannot reach the consensus that we are expecting uh, in terms of acknowledging the different, uh, uh, the different uh, uh, roles and different uh, uh, activities uh, uh, made uh, and the, 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 that the farmers are making, uh, still are making. So, uh, my, my, in terms of uh, uh, capacity and international fora, we have to be uh, aware that there are possibilities, but please, we have to focus on at the national level and to uh, make awareness about the possibility at the local level to acknowledge the different, uh, the different level of farmers' rights, uh, conservation, sustainable use concepts, and so on. Um, thanks, uh, Mario. Um, with this, uh, Rorita, I'm, uh, I'm handing it over to you. Uh, as we're coming towards the end, we have quite a bit of um, uh, questions still un unanswered, but I'll come back to that uh, later in a moment. Uh, Rorita, uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. Well, it's going to be difficult to, to grab up uh, all this uh, really interesting information that has been exchanged in the webinar, as well as all the discussion that we have been uh, having with uh, the, the, the participants. But we, we could say uh, as uh, some kind of a conclusion that, well, with the presentation made by Mario at the beginning, uh, now we know that the recognition of farmers' rights by the international community was a response to balance the increased demand and the protection of plant breeders' rights and the need to recognize and reward farmers for, for their contributions to the conservation and development of uh, plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. And uh, one very key issue that was mentioned also is that farm, when we're talking about farmers' rights, we're not talking about individual rights as we perhaps do when talking about plant breeders' rights, but instead we are referring to the right, our community uh, collective uh, right uh, to all farmers. Uh, we all know we also knew uh, that uh, it's a farmer's rights is a cornerstone of the international treaty, which is uh, this legal binding instrument recognizing uh, the farmer's rights. And uh, of course, it's a pre precondition for, for the conservation and sustainable use of, of these resources. And uh, even if we have this legal instrument at the international level recognizing farmer's rights, uh, still the responsibility for implementing these rights uh, rests at national governments. And uh, perhaps uh, to also underline some of the challenges um, that we still facing um, in achieving this complementarity uh, between uh, the systems uh, is uh, first that we are lacking uh, a common understanding uh, still of, of the concept of farmers' rights. Uh, sometimes, as some presenters uh, also mentioned, there is lack of trust between the different stakeholders uh, and then, of course, a lack of enabling environment uh, uh, mentioning or referring specifically to legal and, and, and the policy environment. And uh, this is one of the most important challenges as we uh, even could um, uh, reflect uh, during the discussion where uh, the issue of, of how can we ensure that these national legislations or the international legislations uh, could be a more uh, holistic and, and um, per, uh, allowed uh, the implementation of both plant readers' rights and then farmers' rights is still a challenge. Uh, and there is also um, uh, the, the reference of the importance of partnerships and collective actions to address exactly these challenges. And we heard uh, different examples from, from our presenters of activities supporting, for example, capacity building, offering technical education to different stakeholders, um, like policymakers, researchers, stakeholders, and farmers, for example. And where these uh, joint uh, activities include uh, uh, the agricultural research organizations, the farmers' communities, donors uh, were mentioned, which is very key also involving uh, in this, involving them in these discussions, the local NGOs, the CGS centers, and civil society organizations. 
Uh, and the activities uh, that were referred to um, as an example of these partnerships, uh, building these bridges uh, among this uh, or between these um, uh, sectors, are uh, where, for example, um, in refer to access to quality seeds, uh, where uh, among these partnerships and collective actions, uh, the the, the uh, community seed banks and the national and international gene banks uh, were trying to uh, get integrated. Uh, participatory plant breeding was another example that was shown. Ben is sharing um, uh, the examples also uh, of how to integrate uh, both the formal and informal seed systems. Uh, the learning platforms uh, where these different stakeholders come together to have a common sense and a common understanding of these issues and also to, to learn from each other and, and generate that trust. And also as um, uh, a last uh, point of, of conclusion, the importance of uh, not only um, uh, deal with the research in the field and the pharma in the field, uh, but, all, but of course, uh, improving these um, curriculums uh, at the universities and the schools uh, where they, for the first time, uh, get a sense of what participatory, for example, uh, plant breeding means and how to really approach uh, both um, formal and informal seed systems and bringing together uh, the strengths of each of those uh, systems. That would be, for, for the moment, my grab up of the, of, of the whole webinar and discussion. <laughs> that was quite a task of, uh, of two, uh, two hours of intense discussions. Um, I'm not sure if we ever had a webinar uh, with uh, that much activity um, uh, on the chat channel. Um, as logistics uh, wrap up, um, there will be three follow-ups uh, from us. First, uh, you will get uh, tomorrow a link um, to the recording of the webinar and a link to the presentation, uh, which has been shown. Um, so you can um, um, review both the presentation as well as the um, as the webinar recording. Um, then we will go together with the uh, the presenters through all of the questions uh, which were left um, unanswered, um, and we will aggregate the answers from the um, the presenters. That will take us about uh, one week um, for the full aggregation. So you will get the follow up a second follow up email from us uh, within the week. And together with uh, Juanita and the presenters, we'll um, um, work on a wrap-up uh, blog post, uh, which can somewhere uh, continue with the discussion, and we'll see with Juanita uh, how um, she can work with this community uh, to see this webinar not just as the, the end, but more as the, um, the end of a beginning, uh, where you can initiate further discussions um, and in the collaborative uh, spirit that Soja has mentioned uh, uh, so many times. Uh, with this, um, again, I would like to... Um, Thank Charles in the background um, uh, for your support, Juanita, for uh, pulling this webinar together. Uh, Mario, Gloria, uh, Sonja, and Bram as presenters. Um, I uh, wish to see you all within 14 days on a webinar on farm radio and community radio, uh, but you'll get an announcement email from us. So thanks again, everybody, for your active participation to the presenters and Gunita for pulling it all together. Thanks very much, um, uh, people. And um, with this, we're closing out the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.